On today's episode, I'm joined by senior ballistician Jaden Quinlan, and today we're talking about bullet drag. At first, we take a brief look into the history of measuring bullet drag, and then we look at the actual equation that defines drag. We also look at ballistic coefficient and how that's measured and the equation to calculate that out. Then we do some examples of how to calculate a BC. We then learn that ballistic coefficient values are tied to temperature and velocity. After diving into ballistic coefficient, we look at the CD versus Mach curves. We look at how to read that graph and that a CD versus Mach curve can give you much more accuracy when compared to using a ballistic coefficient only. Now, this podcast was incredibly educational. It's very deep. It's a little bit longer than usual, but I think you'll enjoy it. I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Welcome, everybody, to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik. Thanks for tuning in on another episode. And I really appreciate you guys that have followed along this whole study of ballistics. This is a continuation of that ballistic study, and this is likely going to end up into a several-part series of just drag, just bullet drag. And I'm joined today by Jaden Quinlan, Senior Ballistician. Jaden, thanks for coming on. You bet. Do it again, I guess, huh? I guess. (laughs) This time, we're properly caffeinated. Yes. And uh, we we have pre-recording. We've been going over some stuff. And this is a podcast on bullet drag. And like I had mentioned in the intro, it's likely going to end up a several part series because Mm -hmm. there's a lot that goes into it. It's a really complex thing to understand. And as always, I know you've got some good analogies. Um, So this isn't necessarily a specific podcast about ballistic coefficient or CD versus Mach, but rather bullet drag and how it works. And then we can get into how we account for it and uh, we can also talk about some of the deficiencies of using ballistic coefficient, which is one thing that we've been you know, pushing now for a while. Mm-hmm. So without further ado, we don't, I don't think we even need to give a break for the listener to go get more caffeine and sharpen the pencil and get the notepad out. If they're tuning in on this one, they probably know what's coming they up. They know what they're getting themselves into. <laughs> yep. This is, uh, uh, yeah, about to be dense, but I'm really excited about this one. The The ballistics study series that we've been putting out lately have just it's been fantastic the yeah. the response i've received have you received people reaching out to you absolutely it's it's really cool yeah to, awesome to hear that feedback so keep it coming keep it coming all right yeah and, and do keep it coming you know if you've got suggestions uh podcast at hornady.com you can get a hold of us directly and we'd sure appreciate you uh doing so or, or you can just drop a comment uh like if you're watching this on youtube yeah so let's get started in bullet drag. So we talked about some of the exterior influences on a bullet in previous mm-hmm. podcasts, um, mainly wind deflection, spin drift, gyroscopic stability, that kind of stuff. But now we've got bullet drag and we're going to take a really hard look at that and I will sit back and shut up. <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> okay. Well, here's my start of the podcast caveats that I usually give. One, if you're just listening to this podcast, I would strongly encourage you to go watch the video form of it because we're essentially going to be going through visual aids, uh, slides. You guys that are actually watching it now, you'll see it on the screen. That's going to be imperative. Um, I'll do my best at describing these things only verbally in a way that hopefully it comes across, but it's a bit of a stretch. You know, some of this stuff's really hard to explain in only a verbal format. Mm -hmm. So if I lose you a little bit there, I apologize. Uh, it's not my intention to do that just for the, the listener only. Please please go watch it if you can. Um, so with that out of the way, yes, like you said, this is going to be a <clears throat> this is going to be about bullet drag, which is really important to us because bullet drag really defines the things that we mainly care about um, in external ballistics. Again, this is a concentration on long range shooting mm-hmm. more so than pistol bullets or three gun. You know that stuff we've mentioned in the past, and we're not alienating those, but these principles really show themselves uh, best in the in the long range application. So that's right. what this is going to be. Now, it's still applicable. Uh, pistol bullets have drag. Um, you know all that stuff. It's it's the yeah. same story here, um, but we're we're talking about long distances and long times and stuff like yeah. that. For and that the reason. big one, like to go all the way back to our first podcast about the study of ballistics, it's time and velocity. Time and yep. when you're shooting stuff far away, that takes a long time to get there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so. <clears throat> To start out, um, 
we have our basic issue. And that basic issue that we're concerned with is if we want to be able to predict how fast or how much a bullet is going to drop due to gravity or deflect due to wind, I would say those are the, your main two, right? We talked last podcast about spin drift and how it's kind of small, but hey, you should account for it. Mm-hmm. Um, Coriolis earth based, all those little details that we really talked about, aerodynamic jump, all of that stuff. Yes, absolutely should be accounted for. The meat and potatoes, however, is drop due to gravity, deflection due to wind. Mm-hmm. If you didn't listen to the last podcast, number 31, I would suggest you do because we go into an in depth uh, look at how wind deflection works and its association with bullet drag. Okay. Okay. So now that we're talking about bullet drag, just keep in mind that that stuff we talked about with how wind deflection works. That's directly related to what we're talking about now as well. So, got it. So, if we want to predict each of those things, how much our bullet's going to drop due to gravity, our come up value that we're going to apply to to the either the optic or use as a holdover, and how much we're going to deflect due to wind. Um, once again, we need to know how fast the thing slows down. Time, right? Fine. We're back to time again. Mm-hmm. So, that equation right there that you see on the screen is the drag equation, and we're going to break this down and look at each individual aspect. A, to hopefully make, uh, you know, that formula, which might be difficult to just read at face value or intimidating um, to, sure. s- to some folks, you know, mm-hmm. let's break it down into its individual little pieces and talk about them so that it's easier to understand it. Okay. Okay. So first part, <clears throat> how fast a bullet slows down is a function of its drag. So let's talk about what makes up the bullet's drag. The first aspect is its shape. I've got a little red box there and you see that I put a red box around CD. Yep. We're going to talk a lot about CD in this conversation today. So CD is the, I guess, shorthand uh, or abbreviated version of drag coefficient. And that's a dimensionless unit that assesses the drag of a bullet due to its shape. Okay, okay. So an easy analogy there would be, you know, we have a truck in this image and then like a sports car. And it's, I'm going to use a, a fuel mileage um, analogy as we go through this. They're not the same thing. Fuel, right. fuel mileage of a vehicle is most certainly not the same thing as bullet drag. However, the concept of fuel mileage, we all understand. We all use it. We, we all, always And yeah. we all use it. And we can understand that a higher miles per gallon rating is better than a lower one. Okay. So when we're talking about the bullet in this analogy, it would be the more feet per second we can retain per yard, the better it is. You're right. That go mean, further. That means it's slowing down at a less rapid rate gets to the target faster, gets to the target faster, has less uh, drop due to gravity, deflection due to wind, the whole thing that we've gone through, right? Yeah. So I'm going to use vehicles through this whole thing because again, it's something we can see. Like okay. the last podcast where I talked about the rocket and how wind works. And I, we use that example because you can see a rocket. Yeah. Well, in this example, you can envision and see and have experience with vehicles and, and a fuel mileage association. Okay. So <clears throat> when we talk about shape, different shapes affect drag, right? It's pretty easy to look at those two vehicles and say, well, that sports car is much more aerodynamic than the truck. So if everything else was equal, as far as engines and weight and all the other things that influence fuel mileage, if those two things were equal, you would say that that uh, sports car at the bottom is probably going to get better fuel mileage, right? Right. Pretty simple. That's the shape portion that we're going to talk about. And this, <clears throat> the majority of this podcast is going to go into detail about that specific uh, aspect, shape itself. Okay. Okay. So we defined one of those terms in the drag equation. Next is area. Area is the A right there at the end in yellow. So with area, let's say the shape is the same. We're dealing with a truck. Uh, in this case, we have a full size truck and then a mid size or compact truck. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of them out there uh, yeah. Ford F 150, Ford Ranger, yep. uh, Chevy 1500, uh, Chevy Colorado, I guess. Yep. You know, same shape, but different area. Now, do those trucks get different fuel mileage? Yeah, they do. I mean, obviously differences in weight and, and engine and all those other things that influence it. But some of that is due to the shape or uh, due to the area. Excuse me. Now, before we move on, area is pretty easy to quantify. We can measure area pretty simply, right? Tape measure. In, in the case of a bullet, uh, we would be using calipers or some, some sort of a more precise measurement tool. But area is really easy to measure. That shape part. Is it easy to measure the shape of the sports car or the shape of the truck? Not really, right? You can conceptually see, well, yeah, it's obvious that they're different, but I'm asking for a measurement. That's not an easy thing to measure, right? And that's why we're going to concentrate on that, that shape one pretty heavily through this. Okay. The next part is velocity. So velocity 
you can see in that equation it's velocity squared. Now this is pretty interesting. So when your velo because it because velocity is squared, the drag will double. I'm sorry, the drag will quadruple. It will go up four times if your velocity doubles. Yeah, big portion of it. Big portion. So I know in the past podcasts we had talked about how drag is higher at higher muzzle velocities. That's the reason why. You when can see it right there. When your the velocity equation. goes up, it's squared. Well, why? I mean, that's great that it's squared, but why is it squared? Well, for two reasons. One, if we think about velocity, and um, let's just say, let's just say we're going to walk across a room, okay, from one wall to the other. As we walk across that room from one wall to the other, we're going to be moving the air molecules that we come into contact with out of the way. And let's say it takes us one second to go from one wall to the other. We moved however many air molecules are in that room out of the way in one second, right? There's a momentum transfer that occurs. I have momentum when I'm moving. Any object that is in, in motion and has mass has momentum. When my body contacts those air molecules, it transfers some of that momentum into those molecules because momentum is a transfer of movement. Okay. So when I'm moving and I'm hitting air molecules, making them move, I'm transferring some of my momentum into those air molecules. So that's part one of, of that V squared thing is I'm hitting so many air molecules as I move. Bullet does the same thing. It's just doing it really fast. Mm -hmm. Now, when you double the velocity, if I walk twice as fast from one wall of that room to the other, I'm impacting the same amount of molecules in the room in half the time, right? Because right. I went twice as fast. Yep. So that's part one of the V squared is the fact that I'm impacting the molecules at a faster rate. And because I'm impacting the molecules at a faster rate, I'm imparting more momentum into each of those molecules because the momentum equation is tied to velocity. So the reason that velocity is squared is because you're hitting air molecules and you're imparting momentum into them. So again, the, the main thing to concentrate on that is when, when velocity doubles, the drag, the equals there at the end, the drag goes up four times. So that's important to know. The last one here is air density. And that's uh, shown as the letter P, lowercase p in this equation. That's uh, the shorthand for density. So when we talk about air density, air density is, is uh, the mass per unit volume of the air. You could think of it as how heavy the air is. So sometimes mass is associated with heaviness, technically correct or wrong. We'll leave that alone. Um, but you could think about it as how heavy or thick the air is, right? How, how close together or how spread are, out are the molecules in the air? Because that's what, the, that's what we're doing, right? Is we're contacting molecules to transfer that momentum. So the more dense the air is, the more molecules we're going to contact with us walking across the room or that bullet. Uh, traveling through the air. So that's why it's in the drag equation, because it's essentially the, call it the molecule count. You know, how many molecules are you going to touch uh, as, as you move? Okay. For this? Okay. So we just defined the four main, you know, variables in the drag equation. Obviously it gets the, the uh, density times velocity squared it gets divided by two, or you can think of it as multiplied by 0.5. Math works the same way there. Um, but most of those are pretty easy to quantify. Is it easy to quantify the area of a bullet? Yep, we yeah. can measure it with a caliper or a micrometer. We have tools for that. Is it easy to quantify the velocity of a bullet? Sure is. We have chronographs, we have radars, we have yeah. all those tools. Got a very expensive chronograph. Yeah, we do. <laughs> uh, is it easy to quantify the density, that lowercase p? Sure. You know, we have a, a, a weather um, measurement device like a Kestrel. It'll measure the air pressure and the temperature and the humidity and all three of those things in combination give you a certain air density so those are all pretty easy things to measure yeah what about that cd the drag coefficient how easy is that to measure it's not that's right. why we're sitting here talking so okay. so now that we've talked about the drag equation kind of given a little bit of the caveat of the of the vehicle and fuel mileage thing uh, we'll start getting into the meat and potatoes but before we do you know me and my appreciation for history I think we need to go through a little bit of this history uh, to appreciate what we're going to learn right after that. Okay, that's great. I'm a history guy myself. Okay, so measuring how fast it slows down. We talked about a little bit about this stuff on one of the earlier podcasts where we went uh, through kind of like the a, a basic history of ballistics itself as a study. And then we talked a lot about Doppler radar there at the end. Um, and if you remember back to that, in the 1740s, um, 
to the 1800s. That's when we were working with those ballistic pendulums. Um, go back and listen to that podcast for the details of how those things work. But that's essentially back in the round ball days, musket round ball stuff, mm-hmm. right? So everything was working pretty good back then. We're getting a, a better handle on physics and how, how things move and all these laws that govern them in this time frame. But we're really limited to one projectile shape at that time, which was a round ball. And it's not like there was precision rifles back then, you know, where we're really stretching time of flight limits and, yeah. and exposing that uh, there's some strange things that happen to this ball when we launch it a long distance, right? None, none of that was really happening back then. But this next phase, it did. Um, the 1820s into the 1940s. So 1825, I believe it was, is when the mini ball came along. And you can see there, um, there's a picture on the screen. So obviously your round ball is up here. That's your mini ball. And you can see there's pretty big difference in shape between yeah. those two. Uh, they figured out that you go to more of like a conical shaped ogive. And the reason that they were able to go to the mini ball is because around that time frame is when rifling uh, barrels started to... Yeah, to gyroscopic stability. Yeah, now we can spin a bullet, right? So with the with the round ball, we didn't have to necessarily spin it for it to be stable because it can't really be unstable. It doesn't matter what orientation it's in, it's the same, it's a sphere, right? Right. Um, but if you do that with some sort of a bullet design like that mini ball where it has a nose shape and then a you know straight bearing surface shape, uh, if you don't stabilize that thing, it's not going to work out so well for you, just like a modern day bullet wouldn't. So, so we go from the transition of, of a round ball to the mini ball. And what we observe with the mini ball is that uh, it's much more efficient. It um, it drops less due to gravity. It imparts more energy at a given distance because it retains that velocity better. So back to using those ballistic pendulums and mm-hmm. stuff. So the mini ball really is the entrance, the gateway into this modern day stuff that we're dealing with today. But there's some other things to to look at during that time. Now I throw the drag equation up here on the top right. Just keep in mind that that equation is what they're starting to figure out in this in this time era you know these in the 1800s they're starting to to figure out and quantify drag wow right there's this thing that's happening to the bullet that's causing me to hit low the further away i shoot it or it's causing it to deflect due to wind all these things are happening right it loses the velocity why is that well it's easy for us in hindsight today to look back and say well yeah it's drag you know it's pretty simple we understand it we just went through the equation pretty simply to understand it right um but I think some some appreciation is necessary there that this was a pretty big discovery then. So also in that mid 1800s, you see chronographs hit the scene. Um, this is a this is a picture of a of an old rotating disc chronograph. Uh, the date on that it shows is 1801. This is a modern day sky screen chronograph that a lot of us are familiar with. But now we're starting to be able to measure velocity, right? Well velocity is going to dictate the time it takes for something to get somewhere or the the time of flight so if we can start to measure the velocity and how much the velocity changes we're getting pretty close to drag with that because drag causes velocity to change right so if you can measure the velocity change you can find the the inverse of that the drag okay now uh 1880 i believe it was uh, ernst mock had discovered he was doing some some testing with like shadow graph stuff so they I forget who it was, but they they had observed uh, uh, the shadow of a candle burning up against a wall, and you can kind of see the 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 heat and how it flows. Yeah. Right, it goes from a, a, a different types of flow, laminar and, and turbulent and stuff. And so, essentially, Ernst Mach had figured out that he could use that same technology, that shadow graph stuff, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. To um, he observed the shock waves on bullets that were traveling faster than the speed of sound. That's 1880. That's wow. that's pretty cool, you know. That so is a, a throw to him, and obviously his name is tied to something we're going to concentrate heavily on in this discussion, which is Mach number. Um, so so post mini ball, you know, we now we've got some instrumentation that we can measure velocities with. Guys are making discovery, like like Mr. Mach, um, and so what you start to see happen is is uh, experimentation start to occur on different bullet shapes and how that shape is affecting how fast they slow down. This is where the G1 and the G7 shape kind of hit the scene. Um, so the G1 shape was was kind of floating around in the 1850s. Um, there was some experimentation that was going that was going on then. The the Krupp tables out of Germany uh, were done on a on a bullet very similar to the G1 shape. 
the Ingalls tables that people may have heard about. Um, there was the Gavre Commission, which was a, a portion of the French, French um, I guess, Department of Defense, you could call it as, at that time, where they, they started, so they, they saw that bullets were slowing down at different rates when they changed the shape of them. And they said, well, we need to, to be able to use these bullets in warfare, we need to know how fast they're slowing down, because um, this is mostly like artillery type stuff at that time. And so they, now that they have chronographs and all that kind of stuff, they start testing these, these certain bullets at a bunch of different, they start measuring velocities at a bunch of different points down range to get some values on how fast they're slowing down. And what they did was they re made all those recordings and then they would make a table that said, well, this bullet slows down in all these recordings, right? It slows down kind of at this rate. Well, that gave you something that you could use from a warfare standpoint to make you know, longer distance shots with yeah. this artillery stuff. So when you see G1 and G7 enter the scene, G1 obviously first, um, that's that's what that was. It was all based on ballistics tables back then. Now you see that uh, here in the 1940s is when the G7 comes in. So the G1 was primarily used um, up into and, and through World War One, And then between World War One and World War II, uh, you started to see the dramatic uh, shape testing going on. Let's put a boat tail on a bullet. Let's put a really long ogive, you know, sleek looking bullet together and test it. And obviously they observed that it, it lost velocity, um, way less, yeah. right? It retained the velocity well. So in the 1940s, the Brits had tested, uh, the G7 shape. It was called the, the British standard streamline projectile. And then, uh, in 1943, um, the U S tested essentially the same version of that. And those tables that were generated from that were used in World War II for the artillery uh, firing tables uh, for use in that war. So, so we see a lot of progression, right? Yeah. I mean, 1880, Ernst Mach finds out that bullets break the sound barrier and sees a shockwave for the first time to now we've identified that we can change bullet shape and measure bullets with repeated test firings and generate a table that we can use for prediction. Now, the other thing to keep in mind about this time is there's no smartphones, there's no <laughs> laptops, there's the, the computational power was essentially longhand. So yeah. the ballisticians of that time, when they were trying to generate these firing solutions and predictions, it took a ton of work. I mean, the stuff we do now, at, at two clicks of a button, we get tables of data that are so big we can't deal with it. You know? I've seen you melt computers using Excel. I have. I have crashed them. That's, yeah. a, that's a point of pride. <laughs> 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 but, but to that point, I mean... That wasn't too long ago, you know? Yeah, when you think about it. And I think we mentioned this in the history podcast. Yeah, 100 years ago. It seems like you know, a long time ago. And in reality, that's like, that's a grandpa ago. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's not that far away. It's really not. So, so the, the computational power side of it is important to keep in mind here because it's part of that history. So we start with these tables because we didn't have the ability to, to do the complex mathematical calculations that were coming out of the physics discovery in the century prior to that to really define it. So, uh, yeah, there's the ballistics tables note. <clears throat> so they're using tables to predict everything at this point. Now, we're going to talk about the, the way these velocities are measured and kind of the pros and cons to each before we continue into BC. Because we just left G1 and G7 showed up in a table view, right? But when we hear G1 or G7 in the modern era, we, we tie that to uh, an input in a ballistics calculator. Yep. Uh, that's exactly the way I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. So before we, before we continue with that uh, point, we need, to, we need to talk about this stuff here, which is how, how things are measured. So for essentially 200 years, we've lived with chronographs and acoustic targets being the most uh, prominent measurement tool that's used, whether, whether it's back when they were gathering the data for those firing tables they're using chronographs to modern day you know small cow industry we still use chronographs right or or acoustic uh, targets which is essentially the same thing um it uh instead of breaking a light barrier for a start and stop uh time over a distance which is what a chronograph most sky screen chronographs are doing light infrared light based chronographs the acoustic target is using microphones that are positioned in an array generally in a square um, that is a known, the, take all the known measurements of the dimensions. And when the bullet passes through that, the supersonic shock wave will hit the microphones and, and trigger the stop signal. So then you have, you know, a start distance, a stop distance, and a time from that you derive velocity. Got it. Okay. 
Now the important aspect here though, this is uh, this is a picture of a, you know, essentially an output uh, of data from a common modern day chronograph. And what you see over here, these green highlighted numbers, uh, they have the title VEL 13. So that's velocity at 13 feet. And the reason it's at 13 feet is because the instrumentation, the actual chronograph screens are out in front of the muzzle. Um, and the, the middle of those two screens is 13 feet from the muzzle. So this is the velocity at 13 feet from the muzzle. And then you look over here, obviously you have your, you know, your number of shots, one, two, three, four here. And then over here, these yellow highlighted ones, the ones that say VEL T, that's the velocity at the target distance. And if you look between them in that uh, red circle, the acoustic target is 582.5 feet downrange. And so you get a measurement at 13 feet and you get a measurement at 582.5 feet. The reason you get a measurement at each of those locations is because you have instrumentation at each of those locations. You have a set of chronograph screens at 13 foot and then the acoustic array downrange. So that's important. You get one data point for one set of instrumentation. That's good, but it's very limiting. Sure it is. Better than the past, but uh, more accurate than the past for sure. Yeah. So you can see you get one, one point per set. Now, we take that to kind of the, the new era of, of velocity measurement, which is the Doppler radar. Not that it's new in terms of, you know, the last decade. Obviously, radar has been around a long time. Mm -hmm. Go to that other podcast and listen to Jacob talk about that history. It's pretty yeah. cool. Um, but here's a... Here's a screen grab off of the Doppler radar software. And what you have on the left here, uh, so that for those listening, this is a, a graph with a, a line that's starting up high on the left and it's slowly drifting down as it goes moves to the right of the graph. And what you have on the left of the graph is velocity and the bottom axis down here is time. And so what that is, is the recording of the bullet's velocity over time as it flies down range. Mm -hmm. And it, as you can see, it decays because it's getting Because it has drag. Yeah. yeah. If we take a little snapshot out of that line, um, and this line is, you know, four point, almost 4.4 seconds long. That's how long this bullet was recorded for. That's for those a listening. long ways away. So that's a lot of bullet recordings. So we, we're going to take a snippet of that line between uh, time of flight 0.6 and 0.8. So just a little 0.2 second window. And if you look at that and you blow it up, you see all those little individual dots there. Those are all individual velocity recordings. And it'll actually do more than that. That's just the way we have it set and what it's presenting to us. There's got to be two dozen of them there in 0.2 seconds. There's a lot. So if we look at it from a table format, which this is that same shot in a table view, and we go all the way to the bottom, this is the number of data points it's reporting. And that number is 54,719 velocity recordings for one shot. For one shot. Well, that's a far cry more data than you were getting with one, one set shot. of instrumentation and one shot gives you one velocity. This is one set of instrumentation, one shot gives you nearly 55,000 points of data. That's a lot. So if we look at that, this bullet was tracked for 1,510 yards over those 50, nearly 55,000 points. If you divide those two out, it's essentially gathering a data point and presenting it to you um, 36 data points per yard. That math comes out pretty easily to one data point per inch. Wow. For nearly a mile. So massive leap in, um, yeah. in data gathering, right? Yeah. That's amazing. You know, like you mentioned, Jacob, that when we left off talking about BC, talking about the G7 in the forties, that's when Doppler radars really came online. Yeah. The, the power that these things have is remarkable. And so that's where these, it's important to keep these two timelines straight because we have coming out of the 1800s, all those discoveries we talked about going from round ball to mini ball to starting to change shapes. All in the chronograph era. So one data point per chronograph. They converge at World War II. World War II, you see the G7 projectile shapes being used. You see the, the trajectory tables that were gathered in that really laborious way from the chronograph method gathered and used for calculations. But then you also see radar start to come onto the scene. Not so much in ballistics yet. That comes later. Right. Um, but, but that point where they converge at World War II, that's what got us to today. So um, if we do a little side-by-side -side here, another way to think about this is, I love this analogy to interject real quick. This, this is, if you can't see anything and you're just listening and you're really unfamiliar with ballistic study as a whole, or if you're a long range shooter, but you know, you just plug a number in a calculator to go shoot. Mm -hmm. This analogy is the perfect example of comparing BC versus CD versus Mach, in my opinion. Cool. Well, what we have is, uh, 
we have a that little snapshot from the chronograph and then we have the screen grab of the velocity radar that showed all those 55,000 data points and we're comparing them side by side and if if we want to say that a bullet has certain drag behavior not behavior in it's alive and it behaves in a certain way but it, you know uh, let's just use the term behavior cuz it's going to work for this analogy if i if i asked you how an animal was to behave that you'd never seen before. Chupacabra. Chupacabra. And I show you a picture of a chupacabra, and I say, how does this thing behave? You can make some general observations from the picture, but you're probably not going to be real confident in describing how it behaves. Mm -hmm. Then I show you a you know, 10 second video of the thing behaving, and I ask you to describe how it behaves or quantify it totally different world right incredibly different that's the difference between the the chronograph or acoustic target method and the doppler radar method one is taking a photo which is one point of data at time it's one frame snapshot of time the doppler radar is taking a high resolution video it's mult it's frame after frame after frame after frame you know it's mm -hmm. fifty five thousand frames in four seconds that's the difference in the capabilities between those two systems so when you're dealing with the chronograph method, again, this was the primary method used in, in the late 1800s all the way up even to modern era. There's still people today that are primarily using a chronograph for drag assessment. You have to assume what the drag of the bullet is before you measured it, between where you measure it, and after where you measure it because you didn't measure it. And that's really important to keep in mind. Because what most people will do, because they're dealing with a chronograph and they're limited to only one data point that it gives them, they assume, based on what it did at that one snapshot point in time, they assume what it did before and they assume what it did after or between if they took more than one measurement. So you're making a lot of assumptions when you use that type of instrument. With the radar, as long as the projectile is in the beam, you're getting measurements. Your your level of assumption is nearly zero. Yeah, you're it getting the high depends speed, on the resolution, high of resolution data. video. Yeah. yeah, so that's really important. Another limitation was your ability to shoot through a chronograph. So especially a sky screen chronograph, you know, you have a a set of receptacles down at the bottom of essentially a rectangle. The two sides of the rectangle are just support, and then at the top of the rectangle is a is an infrared light bar, and it sends down a waterfall of infrared light. The bullet passes through it and it breaks that waterfall at some point. The sensor that would have been sensing that light doesn't sense it, so it makes a start signal. Same thing with the other chronograph screens, a stop signal. Well, you have to be able to get the bullet across that light waterfall to make it measure, right? And so if you're going to try to do extremely long distance measurements with a standard chronograph screen, you have a pretty good chance of smacking the chronograph with the bullet as you do, you know, weaving it through there. Now, there's other methods, obviously, the acoustic array makes that a little bit bigger because you can space the microphones out more and give yourself a bigger window to get through. Um, and then there's stop plates where you can like hit a steel plate and it will, it will make a, a stop signal for the, for the time of flight measurement. Those, me those methods are out there, but they're still very archaic compared to what the radar is capable of. So right. keep that stuff in mind as we keep going here. This leads us to ballistic coefficient, probably what we all came for. Well, we all started with, that's for sure. Absolutely. So what is a ballistic coefficient? A ballistic coefficient is a scaled value that is used to estimate how fast a bullet slows down. And we're going to define each of those um, important terms in there, scaled and estimate. So if we look at a G1, that's the shape of the G1 standard bullet. Yeah. Flat base, long flat bearing base. surface, relatively short OJ. Yeah. Pretty plump. Um, this is a modern bullet that's also a G1 shape. Is it not flat base? So yeah. uh, for those listening, the G1 is uh, is very stumpy on the ogive. The nose of the bullet's very stumpy. Um, you could think of it as kind of a, a pointy 22 long rifle bullet. Most people are familiar with that shape of bullet. That's yeah. kind of what a G1 looks like. The bullet, the other bullet we're looking at on the screen is a modern day VMAX, so a varmint bullet. Like a 55 <clears throat> grain 22 cal. Yeah. Has a flat base, a pretty long bearing surface, just like that G1 bullet does. But that ogive is dramatically different. It's longer. It's more sleek in the radius that it uses. Yeah. Now, let's look at the G7. G7 bullet has a sleek boat tail to it, uh, a bearing surface, and a, and a very sleek ogive that, that most of us have come to recognize as the G7 shape. That's a 250 A tip. 
It's a G7 shaped bullet, right? Yeah, you could call it that. That thing deserves its own drag scale though, because it is it is a juggernaut. It's yeah, it's a different monster. <laughs> yeah, right. So when we when we when we're talking about BC, we say you look like this, right? You look like that um, that V Max. We're looking at our bullet and we're looking at our 250A tip. You look like this, so you slow down like that. Hmm. I have a little bit of trouble with that. Yeah, you look similar to the G1 profile, so you slow down like the G1 profile. Yep. Okay. yep. Because you look that way, you act that way. Mm, I'm going to argue no. Uh, I'm going to argue that that longer ogive of that 55 grain VMAX, it's going to make it slow down at a less rapid rate than that G1 because mm -hmm. it's more aerodynamic. It's more like a sports car than the G1 is. Same thing with this 250A tip. The ogive on that thing, it goes for miles compared to that G7 standard bullet. Boat tail too. Boat tail's quite a bit longer. Sorry, that's way more race car like than that G7 standard. Mm -hmm. It's not going to slow down the same way. So there's got to be a way to account for it. There does. So this graph is really important and I'll do my best for the listener here, but please go look at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a good caveat at the beginning. You're going to want to see this, especially because this graph is red from right to left and not left to right, which is counterintuitive for, sure. for most. It sure is. Yeah. So the graph we're looking at is called the CD versus mock graph. And you can throw that in a search engine and look at images and you'll see it. It's a, it's a commonly available graph that's out there. Um, down on the bottom on the x-axis is mock number. Over here on the left side is, is CD, that thing that we uh, tied to the shape, right, yep. when we were going through the drag equation. Now, as you said, the graph is red right to left, so I'm going to throw a little rifle in there just for orientation purposes. This is not a trajectory. That's not the bullet. It doesn't rise up to a mountain peak and then fall off. Right. That rifle is simply meant to orient you as you look at this graph, that that's the bullet coming out of the muzzle and going downrange, okay? Down here at the bottom in this... Uh, green box, which is your x-axis, we have Mach number. Well, Mach number is the combination of velocity and Reynolds number, but we'll concentrate on temperature because that's easier to deal with. So it's the combination of velocity and temperature that give you Mach number. So Mach 1 would be the speed of sound. As you move to the left, that denotes lower velocity. Lower Mach number is lower velocity. As you go to the right, you go to higher Mach numbers, that's higher velocity. So we're going to think about that from that perspective from a velocity side. I'll also throw in here a range basis if you want to look at this from that perspective. So the bullet comes out of the muzzle here and as it goes down range, that's that's how we're reading this, right to left. Yeah. Okay, so we got that covered. Now let's go over to the left side over here to the drag coefficient portion. Again, this is the dimensionless unit that quantifies the drag of an object due to its specific shape. Down at the bottom, I put a sports car and up at the top, I put a bus. This is where that kind of fuel mileage analogy or aerodynamicness of a vehicle comes in. <clears throat> so on your drag coefficient values, the lower that value is, the more aerodynamic that measurement is. The higher up you go, the worse it gets, the more like a bus it is okay. from a fuel mileage perspective. Okay. Now what this graph is showing us is essentially the drag of the bullet due to its shape of shockwave formations. And the reason I say that is if we come over here, here's Mach 1, right? And if we look to the left of Mach 1 or at the lower Mach values, what happens to that line? It's pretty flat. It goes flat. And we say flat from a, a y-axis perspective over here on the drag coefficient. The drag coefficient just doesn't change really once it goes fully subsonic. What happens when it goes subsonic? Below the speed of sound. Below the speed of sound. It's Gosh. not breaking the speed of sound. It's not creating supersonic shock waves anymore. So the, the area of the graph where we see that the CD values are dramatically changing is in the supersonic realm. So another way to look at this graph is to say this graph is a, is a picture or a measurement of the shock waves that form on a bullet due to its shape and the Mach number that it's traveling at. So here we have this shadow graph image, which again, get on the internet, look at some of these. Um, essentially what it is is a excuse me, a picture of a bullet with shock waves coming off of it. And we can see here that this this frontal shock wave or, or bow shock wave out front is kind of trailing along the bullet quite a bit. And there's really not much happening on the back half here, right? It's mainly just that 
big shockwave up front? Well, that would be associated with this bullet when it's traveling at about, about Mach 2.5, pretty close to that. So that would represent there. If we come over to a drag coefficient value, it's going to put us somewhere there, a little bit closer to a bus than a Corvette, right? But we'll call it halfway just for the sake of this. Let's look at a different one. This is the same bullet, but at a different Mach number. Now the Mach number has dropped down to around one, five, six, somewhere in there. Okay. What do you see start to happen? Multiple shock waves. Multiple shock waves. And what happened to this shock wave that was up front? So the one that was up front here, when we were at a really high Mach number, it was kind of trailing back. What's happened to it here? Now it's flattened out a it's little bit. It's kind of flattened out. It's moved itself forward. And you've created another shock wave up here at the nose. And now you've got one that's starting at the boat tail. That's interesting. The, the speed of the bullet, the velocity, changed the way the shock waves are forming. It's above Mach 1. It's breaking the speed of sound. Like once you're above that and you're breaking the speed of sound, you're breaking the speed of sound, right? So that's kind of a constant. But we see a difference there. Why, why is there a difference? Well, the reason those shock waves are forming at all is because the bullet, the bullet is moving faster then the air molecules that it's pushing out of the way can get out of its way. That's what causes a supersonic shock wave to occur. Essentially, it's a you could think of it as, as waves moving out. So when that thing bumps into some air molecules, those things move out as a wave. But the problem is that the bullet's traveling faster than those things can move out away from it, and so it creates like a compression. There's an increase in temperature and density and pressure of those air molecules that generate that shock wave. Okay. So the, so with that understood, we can see that as we slow our Mach number down, we go from this image to this image, that it's not trailing, the bullet's not piercing through that shockwave as much, right? It looks like it's trying to poke itself through that shockwave on this image and this one less so. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Because so you can see the shockwave is literally being flattened. Mm -hmm. So that's why that's happening. So if we go to an even slower Mach number, here, well, let me back up. So before we do that, this image, you can see that that's a, that's a Mach number of about there, and that the CD value correlated to that is higher. Why is it more like a bus here than it is here? More shockwaves. More shockwaves, and, and the magnitude of them as well. But you're absolutely right. We have way more shockwaves in this picture than we do in this one. More, that, every time you create that shockwave, you're creating more drag due to the bullet's shape. So here's one. Right at like right before it transitions into subsonic, let's say you know Mach 1.1 or 105 or kind of in that realm. And what you see here is that shock wave that was out front is almost straight now, up and down, almost it's, vertical. The bullet's not piercing through that shock wave anymore. And what do you have here? A really pronounced shock wave coming off the base. Right, it was kind of small and starting here in this one, but on this one, it seems much stronger. And you also have another one starting right there. So what that shows you is the, the shock waves that form on the bullet change as a function of the bullet's velocity. Because again, this graph is, is velocity based on the bottom. So when we move right or left, we're changing velocity. Mm -hmm. So that's what this thing really shows us. This graph shows us a, a, a line measurement of how much like a bus or a sports car our bullet is due to shock wave formation. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Okay. Only probably mainly because I'm looking at the graph. <laughs> yeah. Super please, helpful. <laughs> please go look at the visuals. So we have, to, we have to look at this and understand it before we can go further into BC because this is the root of what a BC is. So if we go into BC, this is the formula to calculate a ballistic coefficient. And that formula is the ballistic coefficient equals sectional density divided by form factor. That's not so bad, is it? No. I mean, pretty, most pretty people hear BC and they go, boy, I don't know. That sounds like a really complex thing. It's actually pretty simple. So we're going to calculate it a couple of times here so we feel comfortable with it. Okay. Now, if you're watching and, and you can see on the screen, I have these things color coded for a reason so that we can keep track of everything. So first off, let's do sectional density. So if we look at the formula for sectional density, it's bullet weight in grains divided by 7,000. Well, what does that do? That converts it into pounds because the standard projectile, the G1 or the G7, is measured in pounds. So we need to make our units the same. So we take our bullets that's in grains and we divide it by 7,000. We take that number and we divide it by our bullet's diameter squared. So bullet diameter times bullet diameter. And that gives us sectional density. This is a term that 
that many are familiar with. Oh yeah, it's, it's you know it's listed in every reloading manual. If you go to any bullet, you know, if you go to a website hornady.com or any other bullet manufacturer, you're going to have item number, BC values, and sectional density. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So if we do that math, in this case, we're gonna we're gonna look at a 285 grain bullet with a 338 diameter. And uh, we, we run those numbers out and do that math we just talked about on sectional density, and we get a number of 0.356. That's our sectional density. The first half of the formula is done. That Easy. wasn't so bad. Let's do the second half. Form factor. Form factor has two colors on this. Uh, I have form in red and factor in blue. The, the shorthand of form factor is a lowercase i. So if you see that in other areas, that lowercase i denotes the form factor. So the formula for form factor is CD. Remember, that's that drag coefficient value we were talking about. So drag coefficient of your actual bullet that you're shooting divided by the drag coefficient of the standard bullet. That's why those two things are color-coded. So oh. if we need CD, some CD values, what do we need? That CD versus mock graph, right? Let's pull him in here. So what we have here, <clears throat> that standard CD versus mock graph that we just went through. The blue line is the CD versus mock of the G7 standard projectile. The red dotted line is our actual bullet. In this case, we're shooting that 338 cal, 285 grain bullet. That red dotted line is its drag curve. Yeah, and okay. they are different. They are different. So if we wanted to calculate a BC, we need to pick a Mach number to do it at. So we're going to pick Mach 3. So we take the CD of the actual bullet, up here the red number, so our, our CD value if we came across over here, at Mach 3 is a 205. And then we need the CD of our standard bullet. We pick it at the same Mach number, we run it over, and we find it's a 242. We divide 0 0.205 by 0 0.242, and we get an I of 0.847. That's our form factor, or I. Now, form factor will tell us something. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Anytime that you, you divide two, to uh, numbers like that of the same unit value, you get like a percentage ratio of them to each other. Mm -hmm. And with a form factor, in this case, of 0.847, what that means is that our bullet has 84.7% less shape drag of that bullet there. Than the G7 standard. Mm -hmm. Well, it would technically be 15.3% uh, less, right? Okay. It would be the, the delta between the 84.7 and 100. Um, so we're, call it 15% lower drag, okay? Shape drag wise, shock wave formation wise, right? Our bullet is is fifteen percent better. Now to finish out that BC formula, we simply divide sectional density by the I, this form factor, and there's the BC number. So a little bit complex on this first one, but not too bad. Not too bad, no. Especially when you have the graphs and uh, yeah, you can see that. And this is a really good representation of you look like this you slow down like this, mm -hmm. how that's not true. Because mm -hmm. there's the G7 standard, and there's a 338 diameter, 285 grain bullet. They're Looks not slowing similar, down the same. But they are, yeah, worlds apart in some instances. Like you look at Mach 2.5, and Mach 2.25, and, and they're quite far apart. Yeah. So let's keep going. So at Mach 3.0, the BC of that bullet is a 0 .420 G7. Well, if we wanted to calculate a different BC, let's say at a different Mach number, the first half of that equation, the sectional density, it stays the same. Right. The bullet didn't change diameter or weight when we shot it, so that math that's already done can stay there. Now, if we pick the CD value at Mach 2 of our actual bullet and then the CD value of our standard bullet, and we do the math the same way we did before, it comes out with a 0.889. You remember what it was when we did it at Mach 3? Yeah, 847. 0.847. So it's different. So if the sectional density is the same and the form factor that you divide it by is different, is the BC going to be the same or different? Different. Different. Has 100%. to be, right? BC is a 400. So it went from a 420 to a 400 just because we went from Mach 3 to Mach 2. Why is that? Well, we said that I, form factor, was the ratio between our bullet and the standard bullet at a given Mach number, right? So this is telling us that we're closer to a 1.0 would be a perfect fit. If the form factor was 1.0, that means our bullet has the same drag coefficient as the standard bullet does at that Mach number. We can see here that there's more separation at Mach 3 between the blue line and the red dotted line than there is here at yep. Mach 2. They're getting closer together, right? That's why that I number is different 
That's why your BC is different. It's because those two curves are not the exact same shape. If, the, if both of these were the exact same shape, the difference between the two lines would be equal everywhere, and the BC would be a constant number. It would never change no matter where you calculated it at, because the difference between the actual bullet and your standard bullet were the same difference everywhere, right? But in this case, they're not. So let's do another BC calculation. Let's go down to Mach 1.05. There's the CD of our actual bullet. There's the CD of our standard bullet. Divide those two, those two out. Now we get an I, or a form factor of 0.948. Getting really close to matching it. Yeah. And that's because up here, where we measured it, the lines are substantially closer together than they were way out here. Mm -hmm. Is the BC going to get better or worse? Should get better. Mm, it's going to get worse. Oh, significantly. Yep. That's because, remember, there's a bus up here and a Corvette over here. This oh, is, we're talking yep. about the left axis of the CD versus Mach graph, and the lower you are on that, the lower the shape drag is. Well, what we see here is that the lowest our bullet ever was to the standard was at Mach 3, and it, it kind of trended closer and closer and closer and closer. That's why our BC got worse, right? Right. Okay, that makes sense. Definitely need to see the graph to make sense of that. Yep. So, BC is a function of Mach number. We could say that, I think, pretty accurately, because we just calculated three different BCs at three different Mach numbers. Three wildly different numbers. Wildly different Mach numbers across the entire supersonic range of this bullet, and the BC changed. So BC is a function of Mach number. What is Mach number a function of? Do you remember? Reynolds number. Reynolds number or temperature Tem and velocity. velocity. So if Mach number is a combination of velocity and temperature, we saw that our BC changed with Mach number. Does our velocity change? Yeah. The entire way down the range. Absolutely. So if your velocity is changing, your BC can be changing. This might start to turn on some light bulbs in some, in some folks' mind that have struggled with BC in the past. So now let's talk about, we know that, we know that there was three different BCs that were calculated there. So what happens in a ballistics program when we adjust a BC? So before I go into this, a lot, of, a lot of times what you see put out by manufacturers is that uh, BC is calculated at a rather short range, um, let's say one, two, or 300 yards. And that's because traditionally, before everybody had a Doppler radar and all we had was chronograph screens, those were the distances you could shoot a bullet through a chronograph screen reliably mm -hmm. and measure a BC value. Right. Okay. So there, there, there is a... Um, a tendency to think from the consumer level that manufacturers inflate their BCs. Sometimes they are, they are correct. Some, some manufacturers have in data that we've seen. But understand that the majority of those BCs that have been published are at closer range. And so, as you saw with that Lapua bullet, it was a 420 G7 at Mach 3. But if we were to shoot that bullet at really long ranges, that BC dropped all the way right down to a 376 at Mach 1.05. So that BC steadily dropped because of Mach number, because of the drag curve shape, it would be easy to assume that, you know, you have to drop your BC down to a, a 390 to get your, your ballistics calculator to match what you're observing when you shoot at long range. And so you think, well, the real BC is a 390. Those manufacturers are lying. Well, technically it depends on the Mach number that they were calculated at. So what we're going to do here is talk about that process because most people are probably going to be familiar with the fact that you put in uh, a legacy manufacturer BC value into your ballistics calculator, you go out and shoot. And as you shoot at longer and longer and longer time of flights, you start to see bigger and bigger and bigger errors. So the common way to fix that is to adjust or true your BC number. Okay. So we're going to go through that process. So there's our CD versus mock graph. In a ballistics program, it knows the blue line, the G7. It doesn't know the red line at all. That's your actual bullet's drag. Yeah, that's Unless, what you put in as a, as a BC. Right, right, which is one number. Yes, yeah. not a line, it's which a is picture. made up of a lot of numbers. It's a picture, not a video. It's a dot. Yep. Yeah, you're, when you put in a BC, you're putting in a dot. What we're looking at here is we're looking at a, at a graph, a line that's made of many, many, many dots. 55,000 okay. or more, yeah. potentially. So if that's our BC at the start of the program, when you adjust the BC, uh, in this case, we're going to adjust the BC to a 420. Now watch what happens to the blue line. What you're seeing happen is the blue line, the drag curve of the G7, drops down until it matches at Mach 3. Those are a line-to-line -line fit. 
yeah. because that would be the equivalent of a 420 G7 BC. So if we look at that blown up a little bit, we're looking there. Now, let's look at this from the perspective of shooting, because that's what really matters to us. So here we put a rifle in for orientation again. We're saying the bullet's coming out of the muzzle just under Mach 2.5. That would be 500 yards downrange. That's 1,100 yards downrange, and that's 1,500. So yeah. essentially, I'm giving range markers on this CD versus Mach graph to give you an association there. Now let's look at a trajectory table of what a BC would spit out versus what the actual bullet is going to, to have for a trajectory using its real drag curve. That's what this table is here. So if we look at the first chunk here, we can see that from the muzzle to 500 yards, the lines are on top of each other early on, mm -hmm. but there's some separation that's starting to occur. Yep, right, okay. right before 500, right around Mach 2. That separation, any separations you have between these lines is an error in calculation because what the program knows is the blue line. It's the fuel mileage of the blue line. The real fuel mileage of your bullet is the red line. Those two are different. They're not the same. So what right. we're starting to see is that the, our real bullets, CD versus Mach graph versus the standard, are starting to diverge. There's error. And the, remember, the program only knows the blue line. That's what it's going to use. So we can see at 500 yards, we're starting to get separation in the lines. There's error starting to show up. If we look at that trajectory block in inches in green, not that big of a deal. You know, out to 500 yards, that's a 0.3 inch error. We can't even perceive that. That's no. technically inside the bullet diameter yeah, when we're shooting this 338. Yep. So no harm, no foul, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. You won't even know it. But let's extend it out a little bit. Let's go to that next block from 500 to 1,100 yards. Oh, now we're starting to see some problems show up. So using that 420 BC, we're seeing that we're getting, we're getting errors of 3 inches at 900 yards, 5 inches at 1,000, 8 inches at 1,100. That's getting worse. Let's see what happens. Well, before we do, you can see that the separation there is getting, getting worse, yep. right? We go from 1,100 to 1,500. Things are getting substantially worse now. We're off target by almost three feet at 1,500 yards now. And that's caused by the fact that there's gaps between those two lines. They're not the same. We go out a little bit <clears throat> past 1,500 to 2,000. We're off by... 135 inches at 2,000. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's yeah. like you know, two and a quarter people standing on each other's shoulders. That's yeah. a big miss. Um, so the reason, though, is because our actual bullet as it travels through the air is being defined by that red line. The program only knows the blue line. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hammer that to death because that's so important. Okay, so that was our 420 BC. It worked good out to 500 yards beyond that. We can't live with that amount of error. Yeah. We I can't mean, be off by eight inches at 1,100. Even out to looking at that, even out to six, 700 yards, you're talking an inch of, of error. And most shooters, I mean, your ability to shoot a minute of angle at seven and 800 yards is, is not that great. So you could slough that off. Okay. BC is right. working great. Right. So let's go. But let's say that, that we're a really advanced shooter and we're shooting out to like 1,500. And we're seeing that we're off by three feet at 1,500 yards yeah, vertically. And we say, no, we need to adjust it. This BC is wrong, right? So we're, we're going to adjust it. All right, so we're going to take it from a 420 down to a 400. Now, inside the ballistics program, there's the relationship between the blue line, what the program knows, and the red line, what's real, uh, but the program does not know. And we're going to adjust it from matching at Mach 0.3. We're going to adjust it to where it matches at Mach 2, which is where we calculated the BC value of 400. This is what happens. So that blue line gets raised up till it matches right on at Mach 2. Now, did that change where the errors are in those two lines? Yeah, it fixed sure. it at Mach 2, but it continued to make it worse again at Mach 3 and still at Mach 1. That's right. So let's look at what the effects of that are. There's the muzzle, 500, 1100, 1500 yards downrange. And there's our table of what the BC is going to tell you to do versus what's actually going to happen. We look at muzzle to 500 again. So what we have happening is now we have a lot of separation between those two lines at the muzzle, but they're coming together to where they're a perfect match right at the 500 yard line. And we see when we look at the differences in trajectory, no big deal. No. At 500 yards, we're off by 0.3 inches the other direction from where we were before. Bullet diameter. Bullet, we can't yeah, even observe it, right? 
Now, I will say, the damage done here, the error in line fit, the, the gap between those two, just because we didn't see it out to 500 yards doesn't mean it's not there. The damage done here continues to play and will show itself down here. Okay, So as we keep going, we look at 500 to 1100. Those lines are pretty close together. They are. So we have a pretty good fit between the muzzle and 1100 yards between those two drag curves. Got a pretty good match between the trajectories now, don't we? We do. I mean, you're only off by an inch at 1100. Before that, you were off by eight inches. So a big improvement when Huge you dropped the BC from 420 down to 400. We continue on. Now we're starting to creep into some bigger separations between those two drag curves. And we see that we're starting to get error show up from a point of impact standpoint. We continue on out to 2,000 yards. Now we're off. So before we were off by three feet at 1,500 yards, and we said that wasn't acceptable. So we changed the BC to try to clean that up a bit. Yep. We did. We cleaned it up to where now we're only off by three inches at 1,500. Pretty hard to argue with. There's a lot of things going on out at 1,500. Now we're off by three feet at 2,000. That's still unacceptable, but it's a lot better than 130 inches that it was before. Yeah. So we've improved things. By, yeah, considerably. Let's see if we can keep improving it. Let's take the BC from a 400 down to a 376, because that's the BC we calculated at Mach 1.05, or probably out there around 1,500 yards. Maybe if we use it, that BC, it'll match perfectly everywhere. So the, that blue line just moves its way up in the program till it's a perfect match at 1.05. Oh boy, now we have a ton of separation early on. Yeah, Mach 2 and a quarter, Mach 2 and a half. Yeah, let's see what it does. Muzzle, 500, 1100, 1500 yards downrange. There's our table again. We look at the first 500 yards. We're dealing with a lot of separation there. That's pretty ugly. Not a big impact out to 500 yards though. Yeah, We're only inch. off by one inch at 500. That's not a lot. But again, the damage done here hasn't had time to show up from a point of impact standpoint out to 500 yards. But that damage done is going to continue to influence the bullet as it goes down range. And it's going to show up worse and worse the further down range we get. <clears throat> that next section, the fit's a little bit better. Those two yeah. aren't horribly off, uh, but there is separation. Oh boy, we went too far. Now we're hitting 11 inches in the other direction. So we, At 1,100 yards, you're off by 11 inches. Yeah, so we were off by 8 inches originally with that high BC. We dropped the BC down from a 420 to a 400, and we were off by, I think it was 3 inches. Mm -hmm. And then we decided to keep dropping it to see if it got better. Well, now we're 11 inches off in the other direction. So now we're 15 in, 14, 15 inches off again at 1,100. We keep going. We got really good line fit out here between 1,100 and 1,500 yards. Yeah. But our errors are huge. Why? I mean, the, those lines are fitting really well. Why is, why is there so much difference in what's actually happening versus what the calculator's saying? Time. It's because all of this damage that was done early on is starting to show up. It's had the time to show up. It's had the time to show up, exactly. When we go beyond that, we've got like nearly a perfect fit. There should be nothing wrong. And there's a whole lot wrong. You know, you look down here and now, so we're off by 31 inches in the other direction at 1,500 now, and now we're off by 80 inches in the other direction at 2,000. So no matter what we did, we couldn't really fix it. We could kind of find a sweet spot where we normalized the errors that were there, but we still had errors, right? Mm -hmm. The reason that that happens is because you can't bend this curve in the program. The G7? The G7 is the G7 curve. Yep. That's all the program knows when you type in a G7BC. The only curve that's in there is the blue one. Now, you can't bend it. It can move up and down to try to match what BC you tell it, but you can't put a knee in it. Mm -hmm. That's right. And this is with a, with a basic BC-based program. We can talk about um, methods that people have come up with to try to fix those problems later with other solvers. But for just right now, this is just a BC program. Okay. Now... What makes this even worse is that we just did this with this 338 bullet. Everything changes when you go to a different bullet. The drag curve shape is totally different. The errors are in different places. So let's look at a totally different bullet. This is a 6.5 millimeter 140 grain bullet. There's the two drag curve shapes. They don't have the same relationship that that 338 bullet did. But let's run through the same exercise and see what happens. There's the muzzle, 500, 1100, 1500. There's our table. If we look at the first 500 yards of this, we've, we're, we've input a BC of 295 for this bullet, which is the BC value calculated at Mach 3. That's where those two lines are matched up. Pretty good fit, right? A little bit of error, but it's not horrible visually. 
out to five, 400 yards, 500 yards, not a big deal. We're missing by a half inch. Who cares? Yep. Especially with a six, five bullet. Yep. Let's look at the next, uh, 600 yards there from 500 to 1100. We're getting much more line separation now, and we're getting much more error in what's going to happen point of impact wise. We're off by eight inches now at a thousand. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. Three quarters of a minute at a grand. Let's keep going to 1500. We're dealing with a lot of difference in line separation here, even though they kind of come together once they go subsonic. We're missing by six feet at 1,500 yards. Unacceptable. None of us would be willing. Five feet. Yeah. Yeah, five feet. Sorry. 60 inches. My bad. So, mm, not so bad out to the short ranges again, but it's pretty bad. Now, let's look at a different BC. At uh, and This time, we're going to go all the way down to a Mach 1.5, and the BC is a 316 here. There's our table, our range markers out to 1500. We look at this first section. Now it has about the same amount of error, but it's on the other side of the graph. Eh, kind of probably same effects. Yeah, we're missing by a half inch again out to 500. Now we have a crisscrossing error, right? We have an error where our bullet has higher shape drag, but then lower shape drag. Maybe they'll cancel each other out. Who knows? We took that error at uh, 1,000. We were off by 8 inches. Now we're now we're off by 5. So a little bit better. Yeah. Go out to 1,500. Still not pretty. We're still missing by, you know, 15 inches at 1,500. That's still unacceptable in the modern day of precision. Long right. range shooting. Let's try another BC. Let's see if we give it the BC, uh, you know, Mach 1.1. Yeah, right in that transonic area. Let's see if that'll fix it. Oh, boy. It totally messed up the line fit back down here. So muzzle, 500, 1100, 1500. We look at that first stretch from the muzzle to 500 yards, and the difference between those two lines is a lot. It's the worst yet. Again, we're only missing, you know, we're, we're missing by an inch and a half at 500 now. Again, it hasn't had the time to show up yet. The next block, we're missing pretty bad in the first section of that, the first couple hundred yards of that section. The line fit is really horrible, but then it comes, comes back together right before it gets to 1100 yards. Oof. Now we're off by 17 inches at 1,000 yards, so we couldn't fix it. We go out to 1,500. Between 1,100 and 1,500, the fit between the two drag curves is nearly perfect. They're on top of each other. And we're off by 80 inches at 1,500. Again, that's because the damage done here has had time, like you said, to rear its head. So, with all that covered, we said BC is a function of Mach number. Mach number is a function of velocity. We saw that with two different examples of bullets, and we saw that the BCs changed by different amounts and that the effects of which BC to use varied and impacted your trajectories in a different way. The BC also changes with temperature because temperature is a function of Mach number. So velocity is constantly changing. Mach number is constantly changing. BC can be constantly changing. The other thing that can happen is changes in temperatures change Mach number, changes in Mach number. Change, change BC, BC or can. So you have this two edged sword that's going on, and most people don't understand the temperature aspect of it. We're not going to go too far down the temperature rabbit hole in this one. Uh, I think we should in the next one. That's yeah. the next logical or step. If we start talking about solvers, we got to talk density altitude. Yeah, sure. we'll, we'll hit that. Yeah, this, <clears throat> but, but as far as this goes, just because we're concentrating on this, this BC that's changing around on us and why, well, it's because the Mach number is changing, and the two things that change Mach number is velocity and temperature. So it can, it can come from either way. Uh, but we'll go into detail on the temperature changes and what that means probably in the next one. I think, it's, I think it's too far for this one. Okay. But what we saw here was this was our 338 bullet and the three different examples. And you can see this first one where we ran the BC at Mach 3. We had pretty good trajectory early on, and the wheels fell off to, you know, we're off by... 135 inches at 2000 we dropped the bc down to a 420 so we essentially took those lines and made a meet in the middle we kind of normalized the error there's error yeah. early there's error late but it's not nearly as much as was over here and it cleaned things up you know we're only missing by three feet now at 2000 and then we tried to take it a little bit further and what we ended up doing is screwing up the whole front end of the thing and that result made it way worse now we're missing by 83 inches so you can see here as a shooter that has only ever used a BC calculator and input a BC, and maybe you've trued the BC, you've adjusted it around to try to fix your stuff, that there's certain bullets that can match up pretty well once you, once you get things tuned in. But other bullets, you just can never make it work. 
you can you can be hitting uh, effectively out to five, six, seven, eight hundred yards, but then you're off at nine hundred, a thousand, eleven hundred, and then it starts to come back in, and you're hitting again at fifteen hundred. This is the reason why, or the opposite of that, right? I'm, yeah. I'm nailing everything out to a thousand, but by the time I get to fifteen hundred, I don't even know where my impacts <laughs> are, right? So the the point is that the drag curve shape of your bullet is probably not going to be the exact same drag curve shape of the G7 bullet and that any mismatch in shapes there is going to result itself in a, in a prediction error by yep. the program. Do those small errors matter? You know, we were talking about errors of a couple inches at a thousand. Does that matter? Let's look. So what we have here is a trajectory card. This is that 6.5 bullet at a 316 BC, which was about as cleaned up as we could get it. We had a five inch error at a thousand yards. Now, you ask most people, are you concerned about a 5-inch error at 1,000 yards? And maybe it's a 50-50 split. 50-50 say, yeah, that's too much. Or 50-50 say, nah, 5 inches. I mean, my hand's bigger than that. I'm not too worried about yeah. that. Can I shoot a half-minute group at 1,000? Right, not? right. The problem with it is, is that all of your bullets don't go in the exact same hole. And when you shoot it longer and longer and longer distances, you have essentially a cone of dispersion that's occurring. Think of a shotgun. Yep. A shotgun is a is a short range analogy of a precision rifle. When you shoot a shotgun, it patterns its way out, and the longer distance that um, pattern goes, the bigger it becomes. Mm -hmm. Your precision rifle is the same thing, uh, but it's just more precise, right? But that coning, that grouping pattern that opens up, is happening. And so, if we look at these two images, what we have here on this top image is a is a simulation of a thousand shots with with some real world variables that are input. This is a one minute of angle square target, fairly common. I mean, kind of on the smaller side for the competitive circuits, but a, a common target size at a thousand. If you can hit one minute targets at a thousand, you're doing pretty good. Yeah. And you can see that with this setup, we miss a couple high, we miss a couple left, a couple right, you know, a couple low, but we're hitting this target with this setup 72% of the time. It's pretty good. You're hitting a one minute square target at a thousand yards, seven out of 10 shots with wind and with velocity variation and drag variation and rod dispersion and all those things, that's not bad. No, that's damn good. What happens if we artificially shift that group up by 5.3 inches, which is what is happening when your trajectory engine is telling you that you're 5.3 inches different than what you actually are. That's a shift to that pattern, five inches up. If we artificially shift that five inches up, we drop to a 50% hit ratio. Now, some people say, well, that, ah, that's only 20%. That's not bad. It is bad. If you think about it, um, that's two shots in 10 that you're missing now. When you talk about the competitive circuits, especially, that's the difference between a couple places on the on the finish board. If you look at the top 10, that's sometimes the difference between first and 10th. Absolutely. First and fifth, for sure. So do those few little inches matter at 1,000? They certainly do. They do, indeed. Absolutely. Okay. This is our last one. We'll, we'll we'll leave it alone after this as far as the visuals go. So okay. this is going to be the the summary analogy of of BC and the different ways to use it compared to CD versus Mach. So in this analogy, we're going to go back to that fuel mileage thing. Again, I know they're two different things, but we're going to use it because it's easy to conceptualize fuel mileage. So in this example, we're going to take a road trip and we're going to go from Kansas City, Missouri to Moab, Utah. The catch is that we get one shot at determining exactly how much gas we need to get from Kansas City to Moab. You got to roll into Moab on fumes. No more, no less. There's a map. Uh, so we're looking at a map that essentially shows, you know, the, the path from, from Kansas to Moab. So you're tra traversing Kansas mostly, you know, flat, flat ground, maybe some little hills, getting into eastern Colorado. Again, kind of flat, little bit of hills. You hit Denver and you're going up and down hills up yeah. in the mountains, right? Yeah, you're on the front range. You're doing that and you're coming, you're coming back off the continental divide. You're doing a bunch of downhill stuff before, before you finally end up over there in Moab, just into the Utah border. Now the, the car we're driving on this trip is, is a sports car. It's pretty aerodynamic. We're shooting a 250A tip. That's the bullet we're shooting. That's the sports car. Okay. So when we use a BC, we have a G1 option and a G7 option, right? And the G1 option was kind of the truck or the bus type, you know, flat base bullet, stumpy ogive, not really efficient. Mm -hmm. And then the G7 option is that super sleek and slender race car, super aerodynamic. Okay. 
going G7. Going G7. We're shooting a G7 car. We're going to use the G7 um, BC. What this is, is very similar to, uh, to the fuel mileage rating that a manufacturer will give you for a car. So on the window sticker. On the window. So if we look over here at the Kansas City portion on the map, let's say that the, this car that we have is, is made in Kansas City. And so the manufacturer makes it and they just, you know, you'll see these lines pop up. They kind of just drive around the Kansas City area, right? They're getting the fuel mileage rating, that sticker that you see when you buy a new car of city and highway fuel mileages. That's kind of what BCs are. They're a number from a manufacturer that is an average of what you, you should expect for what this thing will do. Fuel mileage of a car, uh, velocity loss of a bullet, right? How fast does it slow down again? There's that example there. So, you know, a, a, a G7 shaped bullet's going to be more efficient, higher fuel mileage rating here. The G1 is less efficient, lower. So you could think of that as like the, the city highway fuel mileage deal. But let's stop right here. So we're going to take our road trip, okay? We're going to take our road trip from Kansas City to Moab, and we're going to calculate how, exactly how much fuel we need to get there by the sticker on the car when we bought it from the manufacturer. That's what using a BC is. So, so keep that in mind. Well, we know that's not going to work it's well. It's going to get right? you close. <laughs> it may be. Yeah. I mean, you're going through, Presumably. <laughs> you're going through flat ground here. You're going up and down mountains. I don't know if this little highway average fuel mileage is going to suit us very well. I'm guessing we're not going to roll in on fumes. Better we're going to fall short one, or yeah. overshoot. Yeah. Now, so we know that, that that doesn't work right. And we just went through these examples of, of looking at how this BC changed and we changed the BC and it made our point of impacts better. That was called truing, right? Adjusting the BC to make it match better. What if we true our car's fuel mileage? So in this one, we're, we're, we're allowed to drive the car a little bit. And, and measure the fuel mileage. That's what you're doing when you're truing. You're shooting your bullet a little bit at different distances and you're, you're adjusting uh, stuff in the program to, to fix the errors that came from the manufacturer's number. Right. So we drive from Kansas City and uh, we get to go to Colby. Right? We shoot at a certain distance. Colby, Kansas. Colby, Kansas, which is a little less than halfway to Moab. We didn't encounter any mountains or anything though. Uh, we kind of drove through some hilly stuff and mostly flatland, but we have a better average right that's better than what the manufacturer did by just driving around kansas city a couple little times yeah that's what truing is you you still don't have the exact number you need i mean if we take the average fuel mileage that we're going to get from driving from kansas city to colby are we going to nail it on coming into moab on fumes with that number i'm going to say no no because we never encountered mountains we never encountered all that stuff that's going to happen through that colorado stretch of the trip it's the same thing that's happening when you're truing. You're shooting out to six or seven or 800 yards and truing your stuff up so it looks great. And then you go out to 1500 and stuff's off and you wonder why. Well, you never drove that last section of the trip, yeah. right? And even if you did, if you corrected it to it, you're creating errors elsewhere. Right, because you only get one number, mm -hmm. right? So what happens with CD versus Mach is we buy your car or we make your car if you're shooting a Hornady bullet and we drive the entire trip and we measure the fuel mileage across that whole trip up the mountains down the mountains flatland headwinds tailwinds and then we graph it and that graph looks eerily similar to the cd versus mock graph we've been talking about the whole time right right on that's what we're doing with the doppler radar and that's what happens with the ford off program we either make your bullet if you're shooting a hornady bullet or if you're shooting somebody else's bullet that we have in the program lapua uh burger Sierra, Werner Tool, Nosler, Vapor uh, Trail. Vapor Trail. There's a bunch of bullets in, in the Ford Off Library. We go get those bullets and we drive those bullets. We drive that car. We fire those bullets over the radar and we record how fast it slows down. What is its fuel mileage? Its feet per second per yard retention over the entire flight path of the bullet. And then we do it over and over and over again. And then we take an average of all those. And that's what you're using when you use the Ford off program to calculate how much velocity you're going to retain. Mm -hmm. What's your velocity mileage, right? Why does that matter? Because the way the bullet retains velocity, the rate at which it does that is going to dictate the time it takes for it to get to the target. The time it takes for it to get to the target is going to dictate it, its exposure to gravity and wind. And that's where your come up and windage solution comes from. So hopefully that kind of brings it around full circle to understand a little bit of the history of where we came from 
what a BC is, what it means, how to calculate it, some of the sensitivities to a BC that we saw and that it changes with Mach number, um, but also the different examples of using it. This is kind of the, the, the tiered approach to getting more and more accurate. And hopefully that fuel, I mean, again, the fuel mileage thing is not exact, but hopefully that helps paint a picture in a way that people can grasp it. Yeah, I think it absolutely does. It's, it's something that we're all familiar with. And we're familiar enough with BC because, again, that's how almost all of us started shooting stuff far away, mm -hmm. was putting a number that we got from a bullet box, uh, and you put it into the calculator, you hit go, and you go figure it out. Right. And, yeah, you, you true it up as best you can, and uh, not knowing that you are creating other errors elsewhere every time you try to true it. Yep. That's it. Yeah, that's it. In a nutshell, that was a lot of my early days of shooting stuff far away. I was chasing mine, my tail. Mine too. It was all of us. And, yeah. you know, it, we're very fortunate that we suffered from those same problems that everybody else did, but that we worked at a place where we said, hey, every we and everybody is suffering from these problems and we know we can fix it. We know that we can buy some equipment that allows us to measure the fuel mileage of the bullet everywhere instead of that one spot we measure it with the chronograph. Mm-hmm. And we were able to buy that equipment and we started testing it. And then we were able to develop that program that could use that really advanced fuel mileage information from the radar about your bullet, along with many, many other things that we'll get into on, you know, the, the detailed Ford off podcast, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, and those problems are gone now, you know, I, I remember spending a full day, wait, wasting an entire day <laughs> on the range trying to sort out this problem that I just laid out. Why, when I drop my BC, does it work here? And now it's all screwed up out there and I change it to this and now it works out there. And now it's all screwed up in here. Like I'm just fighting myself. I'm spending money every time I pull the trigger, this ammo is expensive, you know, follow, yeah. follow that, you know, train of rage that you get, get to at the end of it. Yep. It's really cool. on being able to be a part of that whole process, have that problem, identify the problem, be a part of the solution. And then, and then to be able to offer that thing for free. So there's no barrier of entry. No. I mean, to, to be able to use that advanced modern day stuff, just, just download it and use it or get on the website and use it or whatever you're going to do. Yeah. I agree The the, the fact that technologically we're at a point that that's a thing mm -hmm. and more so you got to have such a heavy hand in that. And then, yeah, the fact that it's, it's a service that we provide, just download Ford off and use it. Yeah. It, it's not much easier than that. Right. You know, uh, uh, that is pretty cool. I think you did a great job from an analogy standpoint and really laid it out nicely for the listener who cannot see the visuals. But again, like you mentioned, jump on YouTube or wherever you can watch this on a video platform and watch the video, see the visual aids because they, they do a ton of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, it's just really helpful. Uh, there was one thing I wanted to point out that you didn't have, or it was maybe a minor error in this. If you drove uh, over to Colby, Kansas, you might see some really nice mule deer. You might. Yeah. yeah that could be a distraction to yeah, your real fuel mileage numbers. You'd yeah, be slamming, slamming on, the on the brakes to look at big mule deer bucks. <laughs> uh, we're getting close to hunting season, so I'm kind of a one track mind, but yep. do you have anything else to add on this leg? Because I, th I know there's more to the story mm -hmm. and I think that's a good thing a good topic for a second podcast because we've been rolling on this one for a while and I know there's a lot of people that were mind blown like the rest of us. Uh, uh, so this was a, a really digestible chunk, but a dense chunk nonetheless. And I think it's a good time to curb this one here unless you got something else and we'll, we'll, we'll jump in on another one once we maybe get some more caffeine, yeah. catch a nap, something like that. Yeah. I'll touch on one more thing. Okay. So this is all about drag, right? how fast the bullet slows down. So don't just think of this as we went through this with an example of how far you're going to be off elevation wise, vertically on the target. You're also going to be off windage wise, because remember wind was a function of lag time. Lag time was a function of bullet drag. Errors in your bullet drag mean you're going to get errors, errors. in your windage calculations because the lag time is wrong. Mm -hmm. That's not how fast your bullet's slowing down. And so this isn't just vertically, it's everything. I mean, yeah. again, it all goes back to time. How fast does the bullet slow down dictates everything else that's going to happen, whether it's the, dy the dynamic stuff we talked about, aerodynamic jump, spin drift, Magnus, all those things, they're all time dependent. And so if we screw up that piece, the time piece, 
we're screwing everything up to a greater or lesser degree. So keep that in mind. Although we concentrated on the elevation or vertical aspect yeah. of the effects of this, it's everywhere. Yeah, it is present in wind. And, you know, the, it's a remarkable that we, as an industry, you know, the, the use of BC and BC based calculators advanced to the point where we were pretty damn good uh, for, for a long time. And now this, this next progression, though, going to primarily using drag coefficient based trajectory solutions, it's remarkable that we were able to get as good as we were mm -hmm. with BC and hit as much as we could hit at distances we could hit them at. Um, it's, it's pretty cool, but it's also really cool to see the errors and now have a quantifiable way to measure the error. Mm -hmm. that using BC produces and using yeah, BC-based calculators use or produce. Yeah. It's, it's pretty damn cool. It is. It's, it's, a, it's a cool time to be a shooter, especially yeah, with that history in mind, you know? Yeah. So that's great. Well, Jaden, I can't thank you enough, man. This is, you're going to have to be, we're going to have to have like Quinlan's Corner. I have like a separate section oh, of every podcast. That's not a good idea. <laughs> I don't know. The people seem to love you. Uh, they, <laughs> well, hey, if, if it, um, if it's helpful uh, and maybe a little bit entertaining, that's that's my goal, you know. Yeah. And getting to put this information out uh, is really cool personally because I've suffered from all of it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it, uh, but I observed it and I missed targets because of it. And I'm, again, fortunate enough to work for a company where I've been able to sort through some of those problems and figure them out. So if we can pass that on to somebody to help them learn a lesson this way instead of spending 200 way. bucks on a Saturday at a long range, you know, ready to throw your rifle off of the berm, <laughs> uh, right on, you know, that's great. That's awesome. Well, everybody out there, I appreciate you uh, sticking along for this one. I know it's dense. I know, uh, this information can be dry at times, but, uh, if you stuck around for the duration of this podcast, it's evident you're a passionate shooter. You're interested in long range stuff. You want to know the science and that's what we're trying to do. So thanks for, for sticking it out on this one. Uh, if you've got questions, drop them down in the comments. Shoot us an email at podcast at hornady.com. Uh, we'd really appreciate it if you'd like or comment or even share this with your friends. And uh, with that, we'll catch you guys on the next one.